It's my delight and honor to be chairing today's lecture by Professor Osama Maktisi. Professor Maktisi is professor of history and the first holder of the Arab American Educational Foundation, chair of Arab, Arab studies at Rice University. He's our per, one of our preeminent scholars of the histories of the Middle East, the broader Muslim world, and the relationship of the United States and imperial and colonial powers to it. Alongside other books and numerous articles, Professor Maktasi's um, three triptych, The Culture of Sectarianism, Community, History, and Violence in 19th Century Ottoman Lebanon, then Artillery, Art, Artillery of Heaven, American Missionaries in the Failed Conversion of the Middle East, and his latest, Age of Coexistence, The Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World, which I encourage everyone to pick up um, from your local independent bookstore, um, have profound, these books have profoundly transformed our understanding of the origins and nature of sectarianism as idea and practice at multiple methodological scales, the political, the social, and the cultural. And it, they reach across terrains and temporalities to bring into urgent focus the consequences of sectarianism, de sectarianism's deployment in the subjugation of the people of the Middle East by imperial rule and authoritarian fiat. In addition to visiting professorships and residencies at Berkeley and the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, he's been awarded numerous prizes for this work, including the Berlin Prize, um, uh, the Carnegie Scholar, and was a Carnegie Scholar, and the Albert Hurani Book Award from the Middle East Studies Association, the John Hope Franklin Prize of the American Studies Association, and um, the British Kuwait Friendship Society Book Prize from the British Society for Middle East Studies, amongst many other prizes. Um, without, I can go on, but like you, I want, I can't wait to hear about ecumenical Palestine from Osama, and we'll hand it over to him. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mazna. Can you hear me? Well. Well, I hope you can. And uh, thank you, of course, to Omar and to Fabzu um, for inviting me at, to this event to speak to you. And of course, thank you to all of you, wherever you may be, for joining us uh, in these extraordinarily strange and, and surreal times. Um, I'd like to begin by confessing a few things. First of all, this is my first webinar. And so uh, the teething is not just technical, it's also going to be my ability to use this technology. Um, and second of all, um, I'm not really a, a specialist on education in Palestine, as I told Omar earlier. Uh, but my most recent book that Mazna just kindly referred to, Age of Coexistence, uh, is set in a broader Ottoman and post-Ottoman frame or canvas. I do, of course, discuss the situation in Palestine, in Mandate Palestine, as it relates to the broader argument in my book about the emergence and the contestation over what I think is a profound new culture of coexistence, or what I call the ecumenical frame. And what I try to say in the book, um, which uh, I want to, here's the cover of the book, if you can see it. Uh, what I try to say in this book is, is that it's something that I think we as scholars and as lay people who care deeply about Palestine uh, and the wider Arab region I think no intuitively, but if not, I feel properly or fully studied. I think it's fair to say that, that the people of the region, we are heirs to a rich tradition of coexistence rooted in the broad sweep of Arab and Islamic history, a tradition that was fundamentally transformed in the modern era into, and this is the key point of the book, a self-consciously anti-sectarian set of solidarities that stressed equality, citizenship, and patriotism between Muslim and non-Muslim. Like all of you, of course, I'm not blind. I recognize how dire the situation of the present um, Arab region, the Mashriq, is. We live, of course, in the aftermath of wars, of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, of the crushing of emancipation across the region, in Syria, in Egypt, in Bahrain, and other places, uh, we live and are living in the aftermath of the terrible Syrian civil war, um, of the, all the interventions in Syria. 
we see the stranglehold of despotic regimes across the region. We see sectarian warlords, of course, we recently, the last month or two, sectarian warlords in Lebanon, and as I said, despots across the region. But most germane to today's topic, of course, is the ongoing Israeli discrimination, the brutalization, the colonization of the Palestinians um, in uh, historic Palestine. And of course, most recently and tragically, the official, increasingly, uh, the official Arab abandonment of the Palestinians. All the more reason, therefore, to remind ourselves of the reality of the emergence of a cross-confessional and anti-sectarian culture in the modern age, precisely because we are surrounded by so much um, negativity. I don't, at least I try not to romanticize this culture of coexistence in my book, precisely because our region is diverse, and thus the will to coexist manifested in different and often contradictory ways. But I want to reiterate the first sentence of the new book that, quote, every history of sectarianism is also a history of coexistence. I think this sums up the main narrative thrust of the book Age of Coexistence, that contrary to the often sensationalized, overwhelming news that we receive about sectarianism, about colonialism, about violence, about oppression, about despotism, all of which, of course, are real, there is another story that we must not lose sight of, namely how and why and in what circumstances Muslim, Christian, and Jewish Arabs of the Mashriq found new ways of coexisting as compatriots, as nominally equal citizens. And the point of the book, really, and the beginning of the book, um, is, is set in what I consider it to be the proper historical context to discuss Palestine and any other part of the Mashriq, which, of course, is the Ottoman context. More specifically, the 19th century witnessed the weakening of what had once been, as everyone knows, I'm sure, a great multi-religious, multilinguistic, multi-ethnic Islamic empire that had ruled for centuries over unequal Muslim and non-Muslim subjects. And as most of you know, of course, non-Muslim communities enjoyed religious and cultural autonomy as so-called dhimmi subjects of a Muslim state. And this was known in, in the Ottoman period as the millet system, millet being community. This imperial system, which of course was discriminatory, uh, but also distributed privileges unequally. This imperial system began to unravel in the 18th and really in the 19th century. And, and I was trying to tell Omar that I have all these slides to show you, but I couldn't get my, uh, my PowerPoint to work. So you just have to imagine that there's a map of the Ottoman Empire and you have to imagine, or you can just look up in fact, a map of the decline of the, or at least the territorial losses of the Ottomans in the 19th century. It's a remarkable, like diminishing, shrinkage of the Ottoman Empire. In the aftermath, the point is really in the aftermath of relentless European assaults, imperialism, that consistently claimed to protect the Christians of the Orient in the face, and in the face of several internal rebellions, including the Greek War of Independence, Muhammad Ali's revolt in Egypt, the Ottomans embarked on a massive project of reformulating their society and their state. And this was known as the Tanzimat, and the, the, the official dates that Ottoman historians will give you is between 1839 and 1876. The Islamic empire of unequal subjects sought in this period to transform itself into a paradoxical empire of citizens. And like any other such massive transformation in any part of the world, this kind of reform was replete with contradictions and tensions, some far more violent than others. So I don't have time to go into all the details. This is the first half of my book. But I want to underscore and underline two points to get us to ecumenical Palestine, just because I'm trying to set the context here. The first point is that there was, from the beginning of the Tanzimat, the reformation of the empire, a fundamental tension between the imperative to secularize under massive European pressure and thus to proclaim equal male citizenship on the one hand, and the imperative to create a viable modern Ottoman sovereignty that could compete with European powers, which always, or that always privileged the military dimension. So the second point, in other words, so the one point is the secularize versus the centralize. The second point is that this tension between this imperative to secularize and to centralize played out in very different ways in the Ottoman Empire. So in the Ottoman Arab Mashriq, including Palestine, 
it played out very differently from the way it played out in the Ottoman Balkans and Anatolia. And this is a fundamental part of, of my argument. What I suggest in the book is that one part of the empire in the north, in the Ottoman Balkans, in Anatolia, what is today Turkey, what I suggest is that the emergence of ethno-religious nationalisms in, in the northern part of the empire, in the Balkans, in Anatolia, undermined, precluded any emancipatory ecumenical possibility of coexistence that may or, or that, that was possible in the Tanzimat. The anti-Ottoman and anti-Muslim Greek, Serbian and Bulgarian ethno-religious nationalisms decimated Ottoman sovereignty in the Balkans. And if I had to show you a map, again, you would take a look at the map of 1878. These cataclysmic Ottoman defeats, which were formalized at the Congress of Berlin in 1878, provokes a bitter and defensive Ottoman Muslim nationalism that eventually turned on the Armenian and Greek Christians of Anatolia. The Ottoman state increasingly perceived these diverse Christian communities to be dangerous minorities. I'm speaking here of the Ottoman view of the Armenians in particular. And this wasn't all just overnight. This is a process that takes place in the last decades of the empire. Uh, but the Armenians were perceived increasingly as a minority that had to be suppressed. And there's a reason, if we think about it, which I think in the Arab, you know, in, in the Arab world and those of us who are concerned about Palestine don't often think about this. There's a reason why the Armenian question and then eventually the genocide of the Armenians took place at the end of the empire and not in earlier centuries. The other point to think about and what's really important is to realize or appreciate that in the Ottoman Arab Mushrik, including Palestine, the contradiction between this Ottoman imperative to secularize and the Ottoman imperative to centralize was in fact there were sectarian and even there were unprecedented matters of Christian Damascus, for example, in July 1860, that I talk about in my book. But it's important to recognize that despite events such as the matters of 1860 or the British occupation of Egypt in 1882, the Arab inhabitants of the Mashriq were not seduced, for the most part, by separatist nationalisms. They overwhelmingly accepted Ottoman sovereignty. Moreover, the empire-wide renaissance that, that scholars note in education, in printing, in medicine, in teaching, was able to flourish and was evident across the Mashriq. The ecumenical Arab Nahda, the Arabic word for renaissance, occurred, in other words, very much within an Ottoman context. It needed, in a sense, initially, this Ottoman sovereignty. The Arabs of the Mashriq, to point out the obvious, shared a language and through this language articulated a new 19th century anti-sectarian commitment to being quote unquote civilized and i understand it's a very problematic trope but the point is that muslims and christians and jews uh, together articulated this idea of being civilized and together articulated a common opposition to what they identified as ignorance that they said incited sectarian passions. And this was the, the beginnings of this kind of ecumenical opposition to the idea of sectarian fanaticism that, that was rooted in ignorance as opposed to in other people of other religions. And as I said in the book, and as I point out in the book, this is as evident in the writings of a Muslim scholar, a great Muslim scholar and reformer such as Muhammad Abdu, as it was in his Christian Arab contemporary and educator, publisher, and Protestant convert, Butrus al-Bustani who was also a famous writer and encyclopedist and, and a convert. Bustani, in fact, <clears throat> opened the first truly ecumenical anti-sectarian school in the empire that he called the National School, Al-Madras al, al wataniya And again, if I could show you the slides, I would, but I'm sorry again. In the immediate aftermath of the, the massacres I mentioned earlier in 1860, and the point of the school that he set up in, 1860, in, the, in 1863 was that it was a deliberate rejection of sectarianism that he felt was represented in the massacres and that he felt would provoke further massacres in the future if it was not contained by an anti-sectarian pedagogy. So his school was open to children of all faiths and unlike missionary schools of the period, it was, did not seek to convert anybody. 
everybody was sort of set in their faiths. So there's kind of, a, it's a weird sort of radicalism and conservatism at once. But Bustani insisted on the equal importance and validity of different faiths in the constitution of modern Arab identity under Ottoman sovereignty. And he preached, therefore, a new form of coexistence, and this is really crucial, where Muslim and non-Muslim thought of each other as equal brethren. And so this school that Bustani opened, again, it's called the National School, became a template for many other so-called national schools that opened elsewhere in the Mashriq. So what Bustani began in Beirut in 1863, the Palestinian Khalil Sakakini continued in Jerusalem in 1909 in his famous uh, Madrasa Dusturiya or the Constitutional School. Bustani was a Protestant, Sakakini was Orthodox, but both were equally ecumenical Ottoman Arabs committed to fellowship with their Muslim compatriots. There were, to be sure, different trajectories. There were tensions, there were elisions that I talk about in the book as far as what actual Arab ecumenism meant, what were its limits, what were the taboos. And these were often, uh, these different trajectories were often in tension with one another. There was a national ecumen ecumenism, this idea of being anti-sectarian uh, and, and, and this idea, this commitment to transcending sectarian difference uh, of the kind advocated by Bustani and Sakakini that was explicitly directed at Ottomans of all faiths. In other words, not just at Christians, but at Christians and Muslims and Jews and, and, and anyone else, in fact. The other kind of ecumenism was a specifically Islamic ecumenism represented by Muslim modernists and Muslim modernist schools, such as the Islamic Maqasid schools or Raudat al-Ma'arif in Jerusalem, that specifically aimed to educate Muslim girls and boys and to save them, in the case of the Maqasid, to save them from Western missionaries. The late 19th century Ottoman state school system, the official system established after Bustani school in 1869 was also open to all Ottomans, but in practice, Ottoman state schools was under, was under, were underfinanced and they were overwhelmingly uh, devoted ultimately to Muslim Ottoman boys and young men on the grounds that Ottoman Christians had enough schools, missionary or otherwise, to cater to them. So in my book, as I said, I take up the limits, the taboos, the silences, the illusions that went hand in hand with developing the ecumenical frame. And I think, of course, I, I really believe very firmly that we have to be honest about that this is, there are contradictions in developing an anti-sectarian Arab subjectivity, uh, a way of thinking of the world, a way of reading the world. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge that this was a large, uh, sorry, I should say it's also important to acknowledge that this was a, a largely elitist and politically quietest project at first in the Mashriq. In other words, the Arabs did not seek independence initially. There was, of course, widespread massive illiteracy, and there were far too few schools to meet demand, especially when it came to female education. So uh, I, I don't at all want to sort of sweep any of these issues under the rug. And among the problems, and we'll talk about this in relation to Palestine as well, um, was that the ecumenical frame or this new idea of being Arab in an anti-sectarian manner under Ottoman sovereignty tied secular citizenship, the idea that all peoples were equal, irrespective, all citizens were equal, irrespective of their religious affiliation, tied it to newly established religiously differentiated regimes of personal status that continue, in fact, until today to separate Muslim from Christian from Jew, and that continue to discriminate against women of all faiths across the Middle East. So that's one or one obvious problem. So the ecumenical frame promotes coexistence, but it has very clear, it seems to me, limits, at least in its, in its consensus form. The second issue was the unquestioned assumption that the leader of the new modern community or the, the reformed or revivified Ottoman uh, community or Arab community in the Mashriq, whether it's in political or military terms, had to be Muslim. This was an unquestioned assumption among most Muslim um, Ottoman Muslims, not only because Muslims constituted the majority of the population, because they did in the Arab provinces, obviously, but because of this idea that these societies were Islamic societies as opposed to thinking of them as mixed societies. So the Nahdawi socialist Farah Hantun, for example, who was based in Alexandria, famously rebuked Muhammad Abdu, whom I mentioned earlier, for romanticizing Islamic toleration. Hantun insisted 
that true tolerance was one that was prepared to accept that a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, or even an atheist could become head of state in a Muslim majority region or, or masjid. So, so there, there are these tensions. The third limit, and we can go on, there are many more, uh, on the emerging or about the ecumenical frame, was the taboo that became evident by the end of the 19th century on exploring any topic that was deemed to be sectarian, which made, of course, huge swaths of actual history off limits to exploration. So people were discouraged from actually exploring various aspects of history uh, lest they be, lest they stir up sectarian sentiments or be accused of being sectarian. And the fourth uh, limit was how resistance to foreign missionaries or colonialism served to obfuscate difficult questions about the legacies and the persistence of inequality within uh, allegedly national communities. So to state the obvious, to be anti-sectarian was not at all necessarily to be secular and still less was it to be progressive. You could be progressive, but most people, of course, were not. And I think it's important to understand the ecumenical frame contained all these different forms uh, or, or anti-sectarian commitments. You could be a pietist, you could be a secularist, you could be an atheist, but you could also be a, a deeply conservative, for example, Catholic, um, and work within the ecumenical frame. We could talk about all these at length and later. My point is, to conclude this section, is that there were continual debates that occurred in Ottoman Palestine, as well as in Ottoman Syria and in Ottoman Lebanon and in British-occupied Egypt, about where and how to draw the line between Islam and politics, about Islam in the public sphere, about how to educate girls and women, about the value and dangers of foreign missionary institutions, and so on and so forth. But no matter how much the Ottoman state was struggling to keep its diminishing sovereignty intact amidst war, amidst separatism, colonialism, bankruptcy, despotism, there was no concerted Ottoman effort I'm aware of to segregate Arab Muslim from Arab non-Muslim in education or elsewhere. Rather the opposite. In cities such as Beirut, Yaffa, Haifa, Jerusalem, Damascus, Alexandria, and Cairo, fez wearing and self-consciously civilized in quotation marks again, please, Ottoman Arab citizens embodied a clearly viable, if contradictory, commitment to pluralism. One could be more or less secular, more or less pietistic, more or less conservative, with the, na with the nationalist CUP, the Committee for Union and Progress, or with decentralization. But in the Arab provinces, my point is, of the Mashriq, including Palestine, there was no suggestion that the cataclysmic sectarian and nationalist unraveling that was reshaping the Balkans and Anatolia so dramatically between 1878 and 1923, when, when basically the, uh, the, the new state of Turkey finally emerges, was about to happen to the Arabs themselves. This brings me to Palestine and the post-Ottoman era. Because the post-Ottoman era, when the empire collapsed and was defeated and was divided, a new, and I think for Palestine and in Palestine, a far darker era of the ecumenical frame began. And the reason I say this is because the British and the French colonizers who divided up the post-Ottoman Arab mashriq were not simply applying the maxim, the imperial maxim of divide and rule. They were, of course. Rather, they also possessed I think uh, we, we cannot underestimate this, a deep-seated and almost unshakable Orientalist belief that equated religious diversity in the East with sectarianism. And of course, this is a belief that you still hear all the time in America and in Europe, probably, that, that, that diversity in the Middle East equals sectarianism. A sectarianism that had to be allegedly managed by European colonial officials who would ostensibly hold the scales of equity between Muslim, Christian, and Jew. The irony, to me at least, is stunning, and I think maybe it will be to you as well. My point in the book is that the one area of the Ottoman Empire, the Mashriq, that had seen the most progress towards building an anti-sectarian Muslim-non-Muslim consensus was also the one area that was methodically divided up by the British and French along sectarian lines. And so the new conflict between Arab and Jew, in quotation marks, in Palestine, was consecrated under British colonial auspices at exactly the moment when the older question of Muslim and non-Muslim appeared to be most amenable to conciliation. And so this 
then takes us to the tragedy of the mandate. To speak of Palestine, of course, to you uh, and to this audience in particular, uh, of course, you, you will know far more than me in many ways uh, that we're talking about the last colonialism in the world. And in one sense, the most insidious, precisely because of this lateness. It is to speak of the racial paternalism of Article 22 of the League of Nations that subjected the Arab mashriq to the last formal colonial system of the world. In other words, decades after Africa and centuries after the Americas came the turn of the Arab mashriq to be colonized and perversely to be colonized not only in the name of religious freedom, but also in the name of self-determination. I mean, it is utterly, utterly perverse, especially when we think of it in hindsight. Whereas all the Arab East was suddenly stripped of an Ottoman sovereignty, Palestine was the only mandate in which the colonizing mandatory power did not commit itself to even the pretense of eventual independence of the native population, but explicitly, as you all know, to the promotion of a Jewish so-called national home to satisfy the political ambitions of European Jewish Zionists. For in Palestine, wrote Arthur Balfour in a confidential memorandum, 1919, this is, these are his words, we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country, though the American Commission, here he's referring to the King Crane Commission, has been going through the form of asking what they are. The four great powers are committed to Zionism, and Zionism, Balfour wrote, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. So while Lebanon, Syria, Iraq were each subject to a different regime of British or French colonial sectarianism, they were not subject, of course, to settler colonialism. And while the Palestinians had shared in the ecumenical Mahda of the 19th century in all its aspects and in all its taboos and limitations, and we can go in again about the difference between Islamic versus secular and so on and so forth, now their pluralism, Palestinian pluralism, was turned against them. The British mandate and, of course, the Zionist movement in Palestine that it nurtured weaponized religious diversity, which was an obvious hallmark of Palestinian society and urban life. And they did so, of course, to stifle the potential of Arab anti-colonialism and to promote the iron wall of an incipient Jewish state in a land that, as all of you know, was overwhelmingly Arab in 1920. Let us remind ourselves of a few facts that foreshadowed the doom of the ecumenical frame in Palestine. First and foremost, Zionism as a political movement emerged in Europe, everyone knows this, and not in the Ottoman Arab provinces. In other words, it did not initially answer Arab or Ottoman or Eastern Jewish questions or needs, but European Jewish questions and nationalisms, and developed in relationship and in response to European anti-Semitism. The Russian-born Zionist leader, Chaim Weizmann, informed, for example, assembled Arab and, I think, if I remember correctly, Armenian leaders in Jerusalem in 1918, what they already undoubtedly knew, that he was not born in, nor had he lived in, Palestine. But he insisted, nevertheless, that he now returned to Palestine and thus belonged there in a way that they, the Arabs, for example, who were born there and raised there, who walked its towns and villages and spoke its native language, presumably never could be. In Weizmann's colonial, in Weizmann, Weizmann's colonial Zionist ethos, European Jews such as himself had a trans-historical and even transcendental nativity that trumped the actual unbroken history of at least 13 centuries of actual native Arab Muslim and Christian attachment. Muslim and Christian Arabs, as well as the Armenians of Jerusalem, may have lived in Palestine. Weizmann, in his view, belonged there by virtue of his Jewishness. This extraordinary sectarian view tallied precisely with those of Western Christian Zionists, such as Balfour, whose memorandum we just looked at. In other words, Balfour looks at the discusses the, the prejudices of the present inhabitants, as if they're just accidentally there, versus the national home for the Jewish people. 
So tied to Zionism's European provenance was the fact that the desire to reconstitute, of course this was a Zionist aim, Palestine as a Jewish state, constituted in fact the antithesis of ecumenical Arabism. For Zionists such as Weizmann, for example, there could be not an Arab Jew. One was either Arab or Jewish. Here was the first, I think, and one of the most um, tragic strikes against the foundation of the ecumenical frame in Palestine, and in fact across the Mashriq. And not surprisingly, the first major riots between what the British referred to as Arabs and Jews occurred in 1920 during the Nabi Musa festival and escalated, as everyone knows, throughout the mandate period. So in other words, we have the invention of a new conflict. Third, so-called Muslim Christian associations, quite interestingly, sprang up across Palestine to protest against the Balfour Declaration. And as the name suggests, Muslim Christian associations were very much part of a wider regional ecumenical frame that began in the Ottoman era. These associations forcefully rejected colonial Zionism, but also distinguished between Watani or native Jews and the foreign European Zionists whose coercive settler colonial project they implacably opposed. Finally, and most obviously, there was the iron wall of British bayonets that legitimated and imposed colonial Zionism on Palestine. Like the Balfour Declaration, the terms of the mandate that were unveiled in 1922 did not even refer to the Arabs of Palestine as Arabs. The, 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 the charter of the mandate spoke instead only of the Jewish people and of non-Jewish communities, the language of the Balfour Declaration. And it called for both the official encouragement of mass colonization of Palestine by European Jews, the term that they used was close settlement of the land, uh, again, obviously irrespective of the wishes of the indigenous majority. Britain also recognized an official Zionist Jewish representative body in Palestine, the Jewish agency, and subsequently authorized and condoned, or, or at least condoned, segregated Zionist Jewish Movements, social movements, and a Hebrew educational system, all of which claim to represent the Jewish people distinct from Muslim and Christian Palestinians. Above all, while Britain recognized Zionism as a national movement, it categorically rejected secular Arabism. It rejected representative democracy outright because Zionist Jews were a tiny minority of the population, and they remained a minority until the end of the mandate, despite the massive and unprecedented immigration uh, and colonization. Instead, and as a sop to almost unanimous Arab native opposition to colonial Zionism, Britain created the Supreme Muslim Council in 1921 and installed, as you all know, Hajj Amin al-Husseini as the Grand Mufti of Palestine, who of course had no political power or authority, quite unlike the Zionist executive, which worked tirelessly, one has to say, uh, to build up an exclusively Jewish sovereign state. Nowhere, nowhere arguably, was this British Zionist determination, I don't know if this is the right word or not, determination to undermine the ecumenical frame in Palestine more evident than in the segregated educational systems that Britain oversaw in mandatory Palestine um, for Arabs and Jews. As the charter of the mandate for Palestine made clear here, replicating the language that France used in, in mandate Lebanon and mandate Syria, the mandatory power, i.e. England or Britain, recognized, quote, the right of each community to maintain its own schools for the education of its own members in its own language. To be clear, let's be absolutely clear here. Everywhere in the Mashriq, there was a problem or an issue or thought was given to how to build national educational institutions, how to increase literacy rates that were almost always skewed heavily in favor of urban Christians and Jews over Muslims. There were debates, of course, across the region about the appropriate pedagogy, about child rearing, uh, terbia, and about the imperative of female education. There were debates as well about the need to curtail or to support existing missionary, whether they were Protestant or Catholic, uh, schools and colleges, whose combined resources vastly over, uh, overshadowed the parochial Christian and traditional Muslim Quranic schools. In Egypt, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Syria, nationalists competed with colonial authorities and religious authorities to transform nationalism, and I know Mezna has worked on this, from a mantra to embodied subjects reflected in national schools, in uniforms, songs, anthems, school books, 
and nationalist histories that emphasized, at least in theory, a common identity. Whatever their errors, whatever their mistakes, whatever their silences, whatever their arrogance, whatever their chauvinism, nationalist pedagogues, such as the famous secularist Sata al-Husari in Iraq, who worked in Hashemite Iraq, in fact, he had worked in the Ottoman Empire and then moved to Hashemite Iraq in the 1920s as a director of education under a British advisor, recognized, Husari recognized how necessary an anti-colonial pedagogy was for the possibility of national unity in a religiously and ethnically diverse Ottoman, Arab, post-Ottoman Arab world. And so this is something that he recognized, with how do we unite and unify people who are religiously different and, who, and whose difference has been used throughout the 19th century to separate? And so how do you do that without an anti-colonial nationalism? This is what Husseri was, was engrossed with. Now, Husseri's Palestinian contemporaries, and I, I talk a lot more about him in the book, both his, his vision and his, his uh, blind spots. Husseri's Palestinian contemporaries, such as uh, Sakakini, whom I mentioned earlier, or Khalil Tota, or members of the Department of Education and the Mandate, uh, George Antonios, famously, or Abdul Latif Tibawi, were, were given no such opportunity in Palestine to develop an anti-colonial pedagogy. To the contrary, they were witnesses to the tragedy of the methodical destruction of the ecumenical frame in Palestine. Sakakini, who had been the director of the Teachers' Training College in Jerusalem, later which became known as the Government Arab College, resigned in protest when uh, the, the, the Jewish Zionist Herbert Samuel was appointed as the first High Commissioner in Palestine. And perhaps, I'm not sure why, he was later denounced by the Orientalist historian Eli Kaduri as a teacher of, quote, fanaticism. The British inherited the Ottoman state system. And though the mandatory education officials improved certain areas, according to Tibawi's uh, uh, major book on education in the mandate period. Tibawi says there were more schools than previous days. There were two new teachers training colleges for men and women set up in Jerusalem in 1918. And of course, they continued throughout the mandate. Arabic was made the language of instruction in government schools as opposed to Turkish. At the same time, however, the British clearly discouraged and restricted access to secondary education and were increasingly uh, frugal when it came to primary education. There was, this is not, the point is it's not a question of resources alone, but of colonial priorities. As was the case in Egypt and in India, the British were absolutely opposed to educating too many, quote unquote, natives. The Ottoman era bias against female education continued but now in a Manichaean colonial context in which discrimination against Palestinian and Arabs was at the heart of the mandate system at virtually every level in Palestine. In 1932, according to Elizabeth Brownson, there was only one four-year government high school in Palestine for approximately 127,000 Palestinian high school age students. One school for over 100,000 uh, high school age students. British directors, oversaw all major aspects of education in what became known as the Arab public system of education that competed with private schools, in other words, missionary schools, and of course, with a segregated Hebrew educational system built up by the Zionists, which grew from having 124 schools in 1921 to, according to Tibawi, 354 schools in 1936. Tibawi, whose book, as I said, on education and the mandate, mandate Palestine have drawn upon heavily, noted the following irony, yeah, because remember, he worked in the system. Although the so-called Arab system was staffed overwhelmingly by Arab teachers and catered to Arab students, all the major policy and pedagogy decisions were taken by British directors who often knew no Arabic and were totally hostile to secular Palestinian nationalism and anti-colonialism. British directors and Arab teachers worked, of course, at cross purposes. Education for what end and for whose ultimate benefit? Britain clearly wanted education in Palestine to paradoxically facilitate colonial Zionism, to which it was committed, and also to take the sting out of Arab anti-colonialism. It's, it's as if Britain actually believed, or British officials actually believed their conceit, that it was possible to harmonize the Arabs to their eventual dispossession. 
Thus, British officials sought to increase rural education among Arabs to maintain the status quo in villages, while they allowed Zionists to immigrate into Palestine, what, irrespective again of Arab wishes, and to build up urban centers. Thus, the Eton and Oxford, and I apologize, but anyway, the Eton and Oxford educated British director of education, Humphrey Bowman, described his ideal teacher for Palestinian Arabs as, quote, a Muslim Arab wearing native dress, trained in agriculture, in several crafts, though without a word of English, an enlightened, loyal, and devoted servant of his village and country. As Tiberi and others have documented, British colonial officials censored Palestinian teachers, policed the Arab curriculum for anti-colonial sedition, taught Palestinian children about Charlemagne, Christopher Columbus, Richard the Lionheart, and Napoleon, but allowed Zionists to build up essentially unregulated or nominally regulated their own, as I said, segregated Hebrew nationalist infrastructure in education, and not just in education, of course. The mandate presumed that Jewish Zionists were headed towards inevitable independence, the national home, the allegedly inferior Arabs to perpetual tutelage. So that in 1925, a Hebrew university, formerly opened by Balfour himself, was created in Jerusalem, but there was no corresponding Arab university, let alone a common Arab Jewish university. The Zionist executive and the hundreds of Jewish schools did not so much compete with the hundreds of missionary and government and parochial private Christian and Muslim schools in Palestine, they built up their own alternative reality. They literally had, the Zionists had their own department of education subsidized by a lump annual grant from the mandate's own department of education as of 1926. So the Zionists built up their educational system, I'm saying, as if the other schools and the other students in Palestine did not exist. It's like we're going to build our state irrespective of everything around us. Their imperative was not to compete in a shared state, as was the case, for example, for missionary private and state schools in Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, where everybody was competing with everyone. You know, in different ways, of course, but they were all in the same project. The Zionist goal was clear from the outset to build a separate and exclusively Jewish state inhabited by educated Zionist Jews and imposed when the time came on the Arab indigenous majority that was to be made a minority on its own land. The flip side of this steady, relentless, I would say, undermining of the integrity of the ecumenical frame was that it made urgent to Palestinian Arabs the importance to band together as ecumenical Arabs. It's no surprise to me, at least, that a distinctively anti-sectarian national consciousness, a, a new way of being Palestinian and Arab, developed ever more clearly in opposition to Jewish Zionism in the mandate period. And this was manifested in Arab associations, in parties, in strikes that people partook, it was evident in the mixed composition of teachers and students and directors of, for example, the Arab College in Jerusalem, which began with Sekakini as a director and ended with Ahmed Khalidi in 1948. It was apparent in the national schools, such as the Orthodox College in Yaffa, the boys and girls schools in Birzeit, the Nahda College, the Gaza College, the Deir Amr Farm School set up in 1939 for the orphans of the Great Revolt. It was palpable in the Arab scout groups that were of mixed Muslim Christian composition, as well as in the attempt to legalize a union of Palestine Arab teachers in 1937, which was not successful. Uh, and again, I don't want to underplay the tensions between Islamic ecumenism and secular ecumenism, but the point is, and the tragedy is, or was, that um, this Palestinian ecumenism conceded, and this is one of the things that we may, may want to think about a little bit more because it really is a difficult issue to think through. They conceded uh, Arab Jews early in the process to Zionism, so that they're called Muslim Christian associations as opposed to Muslim Christian Jewish associations. And that ecumenical Arabism was not, an, uh, uh, and in fact never had been, a unified or coherent political project. So it was not the equivalent of Zionism. It had been born under ecumenical Arabism I'm talking about and depended upon a unifying Ottoman sovereignty. It assumed an Ottoman sovereignty. It was not and could never have been prepared for the particular, I think, insidiousness of British colonial rule in Palestine 
nor for colonial Zionism in Palestine, let alone for the combination of British colonial rule and colonial Zionism in Palestine. Ecumenical Arabism was a way of life filled with contradictions and lacunae, as I pointed out, that could be and were in fact exploited. But at its heart, and in its most important form, ecumenical Arabism constituted, I really do believe, a viable and humane form of coexistence that allowed individuals and allows still individuals and communities to be different and to be the same at once, to acknowledge and to transcend sectarian difference in a world rife with weaponized difference. Though Palestine was lost in 1948, the history of coexistence in the wider Mashriq did not end, but it does remain scarred without doubt by the Nakba and by the refusal ever since to justly resolve the question of Palestine. Thank you. Let's let's focus on uh, Satar Hussari, for example, since I worked on him, yeah. uh, as opposed to, um, I mean, as a way of thinking through decolonizing what you're talking about in terms of the contemporary now, our current debates about decolonizing the curriculum. Um, if we include Palestine in decolonizing the curriculum, I'm all on board. You know, if if that's the if if, but if it's one of these things where it's you know decolonizing everything but Palestine, then I'm sort of more hesitant. Uh, uh, obviously, like presumably like you and like everyone else. I mean, I want a genuine, honest discussion uh, of of all these issues, all the taboos, to be um, including our taboos as well, to be sort of challenged and brought to the surface. But Hosari, I mean, the, one of the lessons of Hosari, this, what's amazing, Mezna, is that when I give the talk, when I've given talks, and uh, this is the first time I give the talk about Palestinian education, honestly. I'm not, it's not, I've relied on a lot of other people's work, frankly. Um, um, but when I give talks about Hosari, it's amazing how many times I'm told and how, many, how much I've read since 2003 about Hosari being an anti Shia sectarian bigot, mm -hmm. the way he's routine, or a quote unquote ultra nationalist as if he's some kind of fascist kind of thing. Uh, and like he's like Donald Trump, like Betsy DeVos kind of stuff. And I'm thinking, my God, the guy is sitting there. He's trying desperately to think very seriously about uh, how, how is it that one builds an educational system, decolonizes a curriculum mm -hmm. in the face of the British and the French officials and missionaries who dominated education, the educational landscape. Uh, how do you, and, and of course the Quranic schools, the traditional schools, how do you build a new system that actually binds people together of different religious um, backgrounds? Mm -hmm. How do you make them all invested in the system? And how do you do so in the absence of sovereignty or in, in the context of a diminished sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Of course, Hosea was aware of this in the Ottoman case since he worked as an Ottoman pedagogue and then in the post-Ottoman Iraqi context. And as you know, of course, you know, and, and uh, he was defeated in Iraq, ultimately. He, he set up the Iraqi educational system, but in the end, he was not just defeated and, and expelled, but he was, his entire approach was, uh, was, was overturned by the American, um, by the recommendations of the American Educational Commission, the Monroe Commission that was sent to Iraq, which basically advocated rural education, adaptive education, education fit for the level of the people. It was an incredibly patronizing, paternalistic um, idea. And ultimately he lost out. And so the, the, the question we have to grapple with, what does it mean to, like, what is it, who decolonize in what context and whose sovereignty? Mm -hmm. How do you colonize a curriculum? Or, I mean, look at the Palestinians in the mandate period. They tried to do their best within a system where they had absolutely no control over the actual curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you decolonize in that context? Do you do play the weapons of the weak? Do you subvert? Do you do whatever you do? Is that what you do? I mean, I know you're working on, on also, if I remember correctly, you're working on the children and on, on, the, on school, on the, on the actual sort of uh, uh, school systems in Jordan and elsewhere. But how, how, does, how do you work when you have a, a, a sovereign who's actually who is actually um, indebted to and dependent upon the West, the colonial powers. Well, and I would extend that to ask how, in the context of the UK, for example, how do you decolonize the curriculum when the public commons 
or the you know the, the the sovereignty the will of the people is undermined as well in diff very differently but certainly in the last um few years we've we've begun to understand that you know and, and with neoliberal capitalism the decimation of public educational systems um you know you can't really decolonize the curriculum of universities without understanding the pipeline of school students that you're getting in the kinds of destinations that they've dealt with for the first you know 18 years of their lives no yeah exactly and also just to, to and also just to be a bit more humble about this whole approach to understand that these decolonizing efforts as you mentioned earlier have been taking place for a century we have we've had many different iterations of decolonizing the curriculum and it just behooves us to remember that this is not the only first time that people are thinking of decolonizing the curriculum. People have done it in actual colonial situations. And so I think it's important to, to underscore without diminishing the genuine aspirations on the part of people, <clears throat> activists who are genuinely today struggling to actually make for a fairer, um, um, more decent and more humane and uh, more emancipated curriculum. And with that, Thank you so much. Um, that's precisely the best note to uh, close on. Thank you so much, Osama, for a wonderful illuminating talk. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Omar, and thank you to Fabzu and UCU um, for supporting this lecture series. See you soon. Thank you all.